This is the second video in the Propositional Logic module for Foundations of Computer Science. It will cover the syntax of propositional logic. By syntax, I'm referring to the formal aspects of a language as distinct from its meaning. I think it's helpful to think of the word formal as being used here in a very literal sense of pertaining to the form or the shape of something. Essentially, these are the rules of grammar and they tell you what constitutes a well-formed expression. Remember, you've already seen a post system that expresses all well-formed formula in propositional logic, and we'll soon relate this to the definition in Benari's textbook, and you'll see there's some small modifications that we want to make. For example, we might add parentheses, but uh, it's re worth returning to this post system to point out a few things. First, the language of propositional logic really can be viewed as an infinite subset of sigma star for some alphabet sigma that's not too large. And second, it's defined recursively, and this suggests that our inductive proof methods are likely to be useful for reasoning about the properties of this system. Now, we'll put post systems aside for a minute and look instead at Benari's definition, which has the advantage of clarifying some distinctions between different types of symbols that make up our well-formed formulae. So in particular, uh, we divide our symbols into two sets. First, we have an infinite set of variables, uh, which we call the atomic propositions, denoted here by a fancy capital P. And this is an unbounded set, meaning there's no limit to the number of variables you can use. You can have as many as you want. And if you're worried about running out of letters, of course, you can use subscripts. Um, we refer to the individual variables in this set as atoms, and by convention, we'll write them with lowercase letters. So that's our first set. Uh, our second set is just a finite set of Boolean operators, and you have probably used most, if not all, of these before. Uh, Benari uses a fairly rich set of operators that includes the exclusive OR, uh, NOR, and NAND operator. Many textbooks will use a smaller set, and I think this is because it makes the proof shorter, um, but everyone uses an equally expressive set of operators, meaning they're all capable of making the same statements. This is just because some operators can be expressed as combinations of others. And in fact, as you probably already suspect from your architecture classes, uh, we could get away with using only the NAND operator or only the NOR operator and building everything else from that. The difference is that adding more symbols has the advantage of making some statements more readable and making it easier to say some things more succinctly. And then the disadvantage is that you have to deal with larger sets of symbols. Now, how do we combine these sets of symbols to make formulas? And also, what is a formula? We need to define this. So you've probably seen formulas written as strings of symbols, and we'll get to that. But when we do, you'll see we're going to consider strings of symbols as simply representations of formulas, in the same way that we might consider a picture of a spoon to be a representation of the spoon. It might tell you everything you need to know about the spoon, but the spoon is still a separate thing. So likewise, the approach Benari takes is to define a formula as a separate object, and the definition he uses is that a formula is an extended binary tree. So remember, we looked at these before, uh, defined recursively. Um, the simplest formula is just a leaf labeled by an atomic proposition. So for example, that is a formula. A formula is also a node labeled by the not symbol with a single child that is also a formula. So for example, this is a formula. And then the third part of our definition of formula is a node labeled by any one of the binary operators. So for example, we could use the implication uh, with two children, both of which are formulas. So again, here is a simple example of a formula. Now notice when we put all these together, we have our formula, which is just a leaf labeled by a proposition, and our formula, which is a not symbol with a single child, that is also a formula. And it's important to point out that this first rule is a basis, but the second two rules are recursive. So we can replace the children with any arbitrary formula. It may not just be some atomic symbol, but rather it's some more complicated structure that itself is a formula you know, something like this. And this is also true for our second rule in which we are saying the formula is a binary operator with two children, both of which are also formulas. And this is how this definition is able to express all well-formed formulas in propositional logic. 
And we can classify our formulas by their root, which is the operator at the very top of the tree. Uh, and this is called the principal operator of the formula. Obviously, this only makes sense if the formula we are talking about actually contains an operator. So our definition has to account for that. And therefore, the definition we use is we have A be some formula. And we say if A is not an atom, meaning if it has some operator in it, right, because the only way it wouldn't is if it is an atom, then the operator labeling the root of the formula A is called the principal operator of A. To make this all a little more concrete, we'll now look at two examples of formulas and talk about how to read them. So on the left, we have formula one, and the principal operator here is the bijection. And then on the right, we have formula two, where the principal operator is the implication. So just looking at these from the top, formula one is saying this whole left side, if and only if this whole right side. And formula two is saying my left child here implies everything here on the right. So notice if you just look at the nodes, you'll see that all of the same symbols and variables appear in these two trees. So the structure of the tree itself is doing a lot of work. And we'll come back to see why this is important in a moment. As I mentioned already, it is very common to see formulas written as strings. And for one thing, this is generally easier to do if you're typing up a document. So I have here a very simple example of a formula and its equivalent string representation. And hopefully this conveys the basic idea. Both of these expressions mean not P implies Q. So it's useful to be able to translate a formula into its tree representation, and it's not too hard to do this. In fact, we can write a short procedure that will do it automatically. And this procedure is called in order traversal of the tree. Because our formulas are recursively defined, it's natural to give a recursive procedure for traversing them. So that's what we'll do. Uh, this procedure takes a formula as an argument stored as a tree. And first it defines what to do in the base case. So if F is a leaf, just write out its label and then return. Next, it handles the recursive step. In this case, F is not a leaf. So we look at its left and right subtrees, which we call F1 and F2 respectively. And then we just repeat the procedure in order again on the left child. When we come back, we write the label of the root of F and then we call in order on the right child. For this to work, we also have to handle the case where the root is the not symbol and there's only one child. We could handle this case separately, but to keep things tidy, it's convenient to implement formulas that have not as the principal operator by treating the left subtree as being an empty tree that we just ignore. So in this case, in order F1 is just skipped and we move on to writing the label of the root and then proceed with in order F2 on the right side. Now, it's a good exercise to work through this procedure and understand why it gives you the behavior we want, but I'm going to leave that as an exercise. What we'll focus on for now instead is just kind of understanding the general behavior of in-order traversal. This is a depth-first traversal that starts at the top and goes left whenever possible until it hits a dead end, and then it backs up and goes right, and it keeps doing this until it runs out of nodes. So this, I think, is easier to understand visually than it is to describe. So uh, if we do this in our first formula, we start at the root, we go to, all the way down to P, we back up, we go to the implication symbol, and then we go down to Q. And here we've run out of new things to see on the left side. So we back all the way up to the top and repeat the process on the right side. We go down to the implication node and down to the not symbol. And remember here, we have this imaginary empty child to the left. So we skip that and we go back to the not symbol and then down to P. And in the same way, we go up to the implication symbol and all the way down the right side to Q, and then we finish. What is slightly trickier than the order is when we write the names of the nodes we're visiting, but even this is not too difficult. In this procedure, we write the name of a leaf whenever we see it for the last time, and we write the name of an internal node after we visited its left child, but before we visit the right child. So for formula one, we'd start at the root, and go all the way down to the left. And now we would see P for the last time. So we would write a P. Then we head back up and now we visited the left child of the implication symbol. So we write that and we go back down to the right and see Q for the last time. And so we write a Q. Now we head all the way back up to the bijection symbol and we visited 
its left child. So we now write the bijection symbol. And we continue down the right side. And here is where the imaginary child of the not symbol comes into play. We skip this left side, but now we imagine we visited the left child of the not symbol. So we write the not symbol out. And then we go down and see P for the last time and write that. And on our way back up, we have now seen the left child of the implication symbol here. So we write that. And then we do the same thing on the other side. We skip the left child of our not symbol and write it out. And finally, we see Q for the last time. And we've now produced the string representation of Formula One. Notice, by the way, that one nice thing about our trees is that they make it very easy to tell what is in our set of variables and what is in our set of operators. Our leaves are always propositional variables, and our internal nodes are always operators. And this makes sense because our atoms can't have children. So here is a nice typeset version of that formula instead of my handwriting. Now we can repeat this exact same procedure for formula two on the right. We'll just fast forward through this very quickly here. But when we're finished, we end up with another string. And if you look closely at it, you'll notice something disturbing, which is that we now have two identical string representations of different formulas. So therefore there is an ambiguity. And this is part of the reason it can be helpful to find a formula as a tree instead of a string. So we now need to figure out a way of avoiding this kind of ambiguity. And one simple approach is to modify our procedure to add parentheses. In particular, we can make sure we always write an open parentheses before we call in order on our left child and a close parentheses after we call in order on the right child. After we implement this modification, now we end up with unambiguous string representations. This is something you would actually have to prove, but I'm asking you to take it as a fact for now. And the only problem here is that these strings look kind of cluttered and are a little bit difficult to read. So a way of reducing the number of parentheses needed without introducing ambiguity is to define a precedence of operators. And the precedence that we generally use starts with the not operator, which binds the most tightly, and the and and nand operators come next, followed by or and nor, and then next the implication, and finally, the bijection and exclusive OR operators. Most people use this order to reduce clutter and just add parentheses when necessary to remove ambiguity or when it's helpful to improve clarity. Finally, an option you won't see in this class, but that it is helpful to be aware of, is what's called Polish notation. And this uses a pre order traversal. It's nice because it's unambiguous and it doesn't require parentheses. So here is an example for formula one. One way to read this is to start on the right side and proceed left. And whenever you encounter an operator, always associate it greedily with the number of arguments it needs that can be found on its immediate right. So for example, if we start on the right here and proceed left until we hit the not operator, that needs one argument. And so we can associate it with this Q. And now that it has the argument it needs, we proceed left again until we reach a second not operator, which we associate with the P to its immediate right. And continuing this way, we now hit the implication operator. This needs two arguments. And so we use these two units we've just created and associate them with the implication operator. Now proceeding left, we have no operators for a little bit, but then again, we hit the implication operator. It needs two arguments and we use these two to its immediate right. Finally, our last symbol is the bijection operator and it needs two arguments. So again, we use these units that we produced and they become the two inputs to our bijection operator. I will leave it to you to verify that this is actually what we meant when we wrote formula one in the previous slides. If we apply this same procedure to the second formula, you can see we get a different string representation, which is good since it's a different formula. And I'll leave it as an exercise for you to verify that this is in fact the same formula that we have been describing as formula two. This notation works great Polish notation is very useful and has a lot of advantages, including unambiguous representations and no need for parentheses. The only drawback is that you have to learn how to read it. So that is all we have to say about the syntax of propositional logic for now, except just to note that depending on the context, you may sometimes see other sets of symbols out there that are used as operators that are equivalent to the ones we're using, but they just use some different convention. Usually it's pretty easy to switch back and forth. In this class, we'll follow Benari, 
and we'll stick with all the operators in the far left column here. That concludes this video. In our next video, I will discuss semantics and explain how to assign truth values to our statements.